This is our first lecture of our lecture series that is launching officially today. Um, so welcome to the 2022 Russian Invasion of the Ukraine, our free Zoom lecture series. Over the next four weeks, we're going to uh, discuss many topics about the 2022 Russian invasion in Ukraine. Our topics are going to include the historical context, a really big discussion on cybersecurity, and also the role of democracy. Each session will be one hour held on Zoom on this um, format over the next four weeks at 1230. So please join us um, in our session. Today, we are going to talk about the historical context. Um, again, we're going to go over about a thousand years of history with a little bit of a specialized focus on World War II and uh, the Soviet Union in order to inform what is happening currently. Before I even begin with anything, I didn't even give it a chance to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Lisa Wisniewski. I am an Associate Professor of Sociology at Goodwin University, um, and I will be your facilitator of this session. So I will be sort of guiding our conversation. Um, our program today, as I mentioned, is quite robust, and I really am looking forward to this conversation. Um, so first, we're at, um, I'll tell you what the agenda is, and then I'll introduce everybody. Um, we're going to hear a poem reading by Professor Brittany Yancey. Um, after that, I will introduce uh, Dr. Levine and her um, discussion about her presentation about the historical context. And after that, we'll engage in a discussion with Eve Professor uh, Brittany Yancey and Professor Zach Smith about what is going on today. And I'll ask a few questions um, related to the topic and then also provide an opportunity for the audience question and answer. All right, so we have a lot to do today. Um, so before we get started, I'll ask Professor Brittany Yancey um, to read us a poem um, by Tar Tar Taras Shevchenko. And it really sort of sets the tone of our conversation today. So thank you, Brittany. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor uh, Lisa. Uh, can you remind me of your last name of how to pronounce it? I don't. I do not like to pronounce last names wrong. <laughs> well, the real way is Vishnevska, so you know, or Wishnevsky. So, Doctor W. Doctor W. Doctor W. Um, I've been given the uh, privilege of being able to read a poem um, that is so appropriate for this occasion. And so thank you um, for providing this. Um, it is by uh, Tara Shevchenko and entitled Calamity Again. This was written um, in 18. 59. Um, and he has a particular history of himself that I am sure Dr. Levine will talk about. Um, and um, it's so appropriate for this moment that we're in. Dear God, calamity again. It was so peaceful, so serene. We but begin to break the chains that bind our folk in slavery. When halt, again, the people's blood is streaming. Like rapacious dogs about a bone, the royal thugs are at each other's throat again. Um, when I first read this, literally, you know, things just align. Uh, when Lisa and I first talked <laughs> about this series, uh, we really didn't know what today was going to look like um, and how everything was gonna fall into place. And I'm just so grateful um, that everything has fallen into place. And the poem really just sets the tone and really gives us something to think about. Um, to think about this poem was written in 1859 and is speaking to what is happening I'm sure someone is thinking about the very themes that are coming out of that poem in this moment right now. Thank you, Professor Yancey, for the poem and the reading of the poem. Um, for, and now I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, uh, yes, and uh, Dean LaRocco is also reminding us, thank you to Cynthia Murphy, who was able to help us uh, find the poem. And I'm very grateful for um, her help there. 
So next up, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day. Um, Eve Levine is Professor Emerita at the University of Kansas. She holds a BA from Mount Holyoke College and an MA and PhD from Indiana University. Her publications include a monograph, Sex and the Society, in the world of the Orthodox Slavs, 900 to 1700, and numerous articles on gender, sexuality, religion, and medicine in the pre-modern period. From 1996 to 2020, she served as the editor of the Russian Review, a leading academic journal for the study of the peoples and cultures of the writ region. She was the recipient, recipient of the Outstanding Achievement Award from the Association of Women in Slavic Studies in 2021. Eve Levine, thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, can we have the PowerPoint, please? Is it ready to go? Great. Okay, let's go to the, the next slide, please. When Putin declared war against Ukraine, he provided several historical justifications. One, of course, was the threat of NATO. And in invoking that threat, he was talking, he was making reference to the Cold War when, bloc, when the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact, was opposed by the NATO alliance led by the United States. He also talked about needing to protect Russia by eliminating the Nazis from Ukraine. In doing this, he was making a reference to World War II, a war in which the, the, so, the Soviets saw themselves as engaged in an existential, existential battle against Nazism and were willing to make huge sacrifices in order to win. And his third justification, which has gotten overlooked in a lot of the um, American media, was his claim that Ukrainians are really Russians. They aren't a separate people at all. They belong in the same state as Russians, and there should not be an independent Ukraine in existence. In making this argument, he was made explicit reference to a medieval past specifically to the medieval state of Rus. Next slide. So in this medieval state of Rus it is where Putin sees early affinities between Ukrainians and Russians, and he's not entirely wrong to do that. Next slide. What was this medieval Rus state? It can, it, encompassed parts of a large number of, of areas, um, including parts of Ukraine, most of Belarus, and a piece of what's now Western Russia. It's a state that formed in the ninth century along the Dnieper River, which you can see here as the yellow line. And this represented a trade route from Scandinavia emerging under the Vikings, going down to the Black Sea, to the Byzantine Empire, to the city of Constantinople, which was the largest and wealthiest in Europe, and to the Western Mediterranean. There was also a second trade route along the Volga River in green down to the Caspian Sea, but it was less prominent in the 9th and 10th and 11th centuries, became more prominent in the 12th. There was also an east-west trade route leading from Central Asia in the east across the steppes, through Kiev and into Europe. The medieval Rus state was a loose confederation of largely autonomous principalities. The principalities made their own alliances with different states, with Sweden and Poland and Hungary, and with the steppe kingdoms uh, and even farther afield. They got together occasionally, they engaged in short, and not very destructive wars among themselves as the princes jockeyed for power. This medieval Rus state was also multi-ethnic, including the Slavs, Baltic peoples, such as the ancestors of, of Lithuanians and Latvians, all sorts of different Finnic peoples, and steppe nomads, Greeks, Jews, Muslims, lots of different peoples. Next slide. <clears throat> 
one of the key events in the formation of the medieval Rus state was what was called the, the baptism of Rus, dated usually to 988. This was when the Prince of Kiev, whose name in Russian is Vladimir, in Ukrainian Volodymyr, uh, decided to adopt Christianity for himself and for the people under his rule. He chose Eastern Orthodox Christianity uh, from the Byzantine Empire because he aspired to join that Byzantine world. But it was an Eastern Orthodox church that used the Slavic language liturgy and was, ba was a national church, mostly contiguous with the boundaries of the Rus state. It, it was only loosely under the authority of the patriarch in Constantinople. And you see here a, a coin that Vladimir issued. He's wearing a Byzantine style crown. And over his right shoulder, you see a trident symbol. That trident symbol has become the emblem of modern Ukraine. Next slide. In the mid 13th century, the different parts of the Rus state diverged into different paths. And we'll see how that happened. Next. It happened because of the Mongol conquest. The Mongol empire was based in Central Asia. It was the most powerful kingdom militarily in the world at the time. Now, Europe was very far from their center of power and their center of interest, but even so, in two campaigns in 1237 and 1240, the Mongols conquered the media the medieval Rus state. After a few decades, they withdrew from the southwestern Rus lands, those that became Ukraine and Belarus, but they retained control of the northeastern Rus principalities, those within the Volga watershed. Next. So the northeastern Rus principalities remained vassals of the Tatars until 1480. Under, under um, Tatar rule, the, a, new, a new capital was located at Moscow. Moscow had been a small town, scarcely of note, until the princes of Moscow under, under Mongol rule found themselves particularly adept at managing the new situation. Over the next three centuries, they build a, built a centralized state, absorbing all the Rus principalities that were under uh, Mongol rule. They lured the head of the, of the church to Moscow and the, and, the, and the Orthodox church upheld the state. And then after liberation from Mongol rule, they engaged in expansion to the far north, up to the Arctic Ocean, down the Volga River, down to the Caspian Sea, even across the Urals into Western Siberia. Now, this was not a state that enjoyed complete and untroubled existence. After the death of uh, Tsar Ivan the Terrible, I think everybody has heard how that he was terrible, the state fell apart and underwent a, a period of conflict civil war from 1584 to 1613. During this time, they experienced not only internal violence, but also in foreign invasions, most notably from Poland, where Polish armies occupied Moscow more than once. Next slide. Meanwhile, the southeastern principalities of Rus, the area that became Ukraine and Belarus, fell under Polish-Lithuanian rule. Within the Polish-Lithuanian state, these East Slavs, these peoples of Rus, were not only an ethnic minority, but also a religious minority. They were Eastern Orthodox, while Poles and Lithuanians were predominantly Roman Catholic. For that reason, the, the, the Rus leaders found themselves in a difficult position within the Polish-Lithuanian state, unable to advance into the higher reaches of power and to gain most of the economic benefits. As a result of this, there were those people within the, uh, among the Rus people within the Polish-Lithuanian state who decided to leave. They, fl they migrated to the borderlands where they formed free communities 
who called themselves Cossacks. Some of the people who um, came there were from Ukraine. Others came fleeing from Muscovy, fleeing from the autocratic rule and the disorders of the time of troubles. These Cossack communities had to defend themselves on the steppe, not only against the Poles and the Muscovites, but also against the Tatars who were still very powerful. The mo one of the most famous and successful of these Cossack leaders was Bogdan Khmelnytsky, who in 1648 staged a successful revolt against the Polish-Lithuanian state. Next slide. As a result of this revolt, Melnitsky and his Cossacks set up a Ukrainian, an independent Ukrainian Republic, which lasted from, for just a few years. Next slide. Now, Melnitsky had was facing a problem. The Poles did not want to acknowledge the legitimacy of an independent Ukrainian state. And he was also faced with Tatars backed by Ottoman Turks. He needed an ally. So he turned to Muscovy, the enemy of, of Poland, and also because they were co-religionists, the Cossacks being predominantly Eastern Orthodox, as were the Muscovites. In 1654, they signed a treaty at the Ukrainian city of Karyoslav. In the view of Khmelnytsky and the Ukrainians, this was an alliance of two independent states, Ukraine and Muscovy against Poland. The Muscovites saw things differently. They thought that this treaty meant that the Ukrainians were putting themselves under the authority of Muscovy permanently, in other words, agreeing to annexation. Mm -hmm. In 1667, at the close of a war between Muscovy and, and Poland-Lithuania, the two warring parties, minus the Ukrainians, agreed to partition Ukraine between them. Eastern Ukraine ended up under the authority of Muscovy, and Western Ukraine ended up under the authority of Poland-Lithuania once again. But Khmelnytsky's Cossack Republic provides for Ukrainians today a precedent of an independent Ukrainian state as we see from this mon monument to him in Kiev. Next slide. So what was the, the fate of Ukraine as part of this Russian empire? Next slide. First, there were more. There was more territory that was that is now part of Ukraine that was annexed by Russia in the 18th century, particularly the Crimean Peninsula and the area to the north of it, where after a war with the Crimean Tatar Khanate and its Ottoman allies, Russia won. And then there was a further gain of Ukrainian territory when Russia, Prussia, and Austria got together and partitioned Poland in three stages in the 18th century. With that, the lands that had been part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that had been ceded in 1667 ended up as part of Russian territory as well. Next slide. Well, what was it like for Ukraine under, Russia, under the rule of the Russian empire? The Russian policy was to try to pacify Ukraine. First, this meant subordinating the Cossacks to the, to the Russian imperial government because the Cossacks were unhappy with how their freedom had been, had been usurped, taken away from them, and they continued to rebel again and again and again. Uh, in addition, Russian policy discouraged Ukrainian language. From the point of view of the Russian authorities, Ukrainian was just a regional dialect of Russian. There was no reason for anyone to write in that language, except you know, perhaps in fictional works in order to show a little bit of local color. And as the, was the policy throughout the Russian empire, they, they, they suppressed dissent particularly the dissent that, want, that called for independence, as it did in Ukraine. They also suppressed revolutionaries, that is, people, whether Russian or of other um, 
or of, of other ethnicities who were calling for the complete overthrow of the government, a transformation to a different governmental form and a different economic system. Despite all this, there was a flourishing of Ukrainian culture in the 19th century with works written in, in fictional works, historical works, ethnographic works. The historian Mikhail, Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, who wrote the histories of Ukraine that took a very different anti-imperial view of Ukrainian history, is now a hero of Ukraine. He appears on their on Ukrainian money. World War I ex exposed the weaknesses of the Russian government, as it did of the governments of Austria, Hungary, and Prussia as well. Next slide. As a, and as a result of the wars and revolutions, there was a, an independent Ukraine was born again in 1918. Next slide. How did this happen? In February 1917, a popular revolution within Russia overthrew the government of the Tsar. It was followed eight months later in October 1917 by a coup d'etat by the Bolsheviks, a radical communist party. Within the turmoil of, war, of World War I, revolution and civil war, multiple Ukrainian actors decided to try to reclaim Ukrainian independence. One of the most important, the ones that the modern day Ukrainians most look at was the Hetmanate, um, founded by Pavlo Skoropadsky. You see him there in Cossack uniform. He was deliberately trying to recall the, the Ukrainian Cossack Republic of the 17th century. Mm. But in addition, there were Ukrainian socialists in Kiev who decided that they were going to try to found their own independent socialist state. There were Bolsheviks in Kharkiv. There were also generals of the old Imperial Russian army who were trying to reclaim territory in Ukraine in order to use it as a base to reestablish the Russian empire and the Tsar. And then there were the anarchists who didn't want any government at all, seeing them all as, as oppressive. Next slide. At the end of the war, the, and the Civil War, though, Ukraine was forcibly reintegrated into the Soviet Union when the Bolsheviks won. Next slide. Well, what were the Soviet policies toward this Ukraine? The Soviet Union officially took an anti-imperial stand, that they were not like an empire, they were not going to oppress the peoples within them. And so they insisted on creating separate so Soviet socialist republics for the major nationalities. So there was a Ukrainian Soviet socialist republic that had a certain measure of uh, purview over things in Ukraine. And the Soviets also promoted use of Ukrainian language within Ukraine. They liked Ukrainian folk culture as long as it wasn't religious in its orientation. But at the same time, they were very concerned about having all parts of the Soviet Union work together in lockstep in a centralized system of government based in Moscow. Ukrainian leaders, from the point of view of the authorities in Moscow, were simply not reliable enough. And many of the Ukrainian leaders, both political leaders and particularly cultural leaders, were purged. They were fired from their positions and then later arrested deported to distant parts uh, of the Soviet Union. And in many cases, they were executed. One of the most horrific aspects of Soviet policy was the, collect was the collectivization of agriculture, which occurred under Stalin be beginning in 1929. Because for ideological reasons, he believed that agriculture ought to be collectivized. What this meant was brutally confiscating land from farmers, confiscating their, 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 their supplies of, of grain and other sorts of foodstuffs, confiscating their livestock, and throwing them out of their homes. This was done with particular brutality in Ukraine, which was regarded as insufficiently loyal. The result was a man-made famine, which Ukrainians call the Holodomor, 
that is a uh, death by famine. There were, there were millions of people who died of hunger or who were executed in the course of this uh, of collectivization of agriculture. It's a, a, a horrific event which is commemorated in many places, particularly in Ukraine, but also around the world. Next slide. Soon after, Ukraine was devastated again further by World War II. Just prior to Hitler's invasion of Poland, Hitler and Stalin agreed to a non-aggression pact in 1939. This gave the Soviet Union the right to annex lands in Eastern Poland, Baltic states, and also Western Ukraine, areas that previously had not been part of the Russian empire. But Hitler had no intention of following through with the non-aggression pact, and in 1941, he launched an invasion of the Soviet Union. Ukraine lay in the direct path of this invasion. Almost all of Ukraine ended up occupied by the Nazis, who ruled Ukraine in a very brutal manner. We've all heard about the mass murders of Jews and Roma throughout the territory. There was also, Ukrainians were also forced into labor for the Nazis, both in, within Ukraine itself and in other Nazi-occupied territories. Now, there were some Ukrainians, a very relatively few, who were so anti-Soviet based on the, tr the treatment of Ukraine by the Soviet Union that they collaborated with the Nazis, not out of any love of, of fascism, but out of love for, for Ukraine. But there were many more Ukrainians who fought against the Nazis, joining the Red Army as President Volodymyr Zelensky's grandfather did, or fighting as partisans behind enemy lines. Next slide. After the war, Ukraine, of course, ended up back within the Soviet Union. And I'm going to skip over here to the 1980s when the Soviet Union was in decline, although that was not very well recognized in the West until much later. Within Ukraine, there, was a, there were many people who were unhappy with Soviet rule, but speaking out very bluntly would get them arrested and many of them decided not to do it. So instead what was very common was a kind of intellectual nonconformity where they would push the boundaries of what was permitted within the Soviet system to, their, to the extremes, backing off when they needed to, and very quietly among themselves, talking about how they were dreaming of a different sort of situation of an independent Ukraine. When Mikhail Gorbachev took power in 1985, he instituted a new policy called glasnost, openness, to discuss uh, freely the, the, the problems within the Soviet Union. Ukrainians were very happy to discuss the, the problems within the Soviet Union. And they started talking about independence, especially after 1989, when the Eastern European client states of the Soviet Union declared their independence. So in 1991, it was Ukrainians who decided to vote to enforce the supposedly voluntary nature of the Soviet Union, and they said that Ukraine was going to exit it. This prompted uh, the other republics to exit the Soviet Union as well. So all the constituent parts of the Soviet Union ended up leaving, resulting in the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. And all these constituent republics also re rejected communism as a political and economic system. Next slide. So, in 1991, a, an independent Ukraine was reborn. Next slide. Now, this independent Ukraine was located between Russia and the West. It was politically not very stable. There was a problem with corruption within the government. Um, there were serious problems with election meddling, particularly by Russia. Um, the techniques that we experienced in the United States in 2016 were tried out on Ukraine earlier 
Twice Ukrainians took to the streets when they thought that their governments were corrupt, improperly elected, and taking Ukraine in the wrong direction, backed into the arms of Russia. Once was in 2004, the Orange Revolution, as it's called. And then again in 2013, the, what's called the Revolution of Dignity. And you can see that um, the gathering on the Maidan in 2013 with the pictures, with the flags showing the interest in joining the European Union and, and NATO. There were on the Maidan ultra national Ukrainian nationalists who you might think of as having fascist tendencies, but they were the, a small minority among a much broader popular revolt. You met, the majority of Ukrainians were hoping for NATO membership eventually. It was not something that NATO was interested in doing. They were hoping for EU membership eventually for the economic advantages. And in addition, Ukrainian Orthodox Christians were looking for their own independent church. They no longer wanted to be under the authority of the Orthodox Church based in Moscow, which was becoming increasingly nationalistic. Next slide. In 2014, Putin's gov Russian government launched invasions of Ukraine an invasion and annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, the Ukrainians decided that they did not want to be involved in bloodshed and the Ukrainian government voluntarily left Ukraine rather than launch a civil war there. In, de in the Eastern provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk, pro-Russian insurgents decided to claim power. And this was done with extreme violence. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of destruction. You see the Donetsk airport and what was hap happened there. The insurgents were, ba were backed by Russian volunteers. That is Russian soldiers who voluntarily, spurred by their commanders, went to, went to um, Donetsk and Luhansk in order to fight for them. The Ukrainian response to this was much subdued, not trying to engage in war, but also not acknowledging the legitimacy of the Donetsk and Luhansk um, insurgents and not acknowledging the legitimacy of the annexation of Crimea. Next slide. Which leads us to the next stage of the 2014 war, the formal Russian invasion of Ukraine just a month ago. And I think I should stop here because we're getting out of the area of history. Thank you so much, Eve, for a thousand plus years of history in a very short amount of time. Um, I think a lot of the um, information you presented really gives us some um, background context and historical context into what are we seeing in the modern world? So thank you so much for, for your remarks and presentation. Um, at this time, I'll ask Professor uh, Brittany Yancey and Professor Zach Smith to sort of join us in a brief uh, panel discussion um, about where are we now. Um, so we have a few questions that we'll ask and sort of discuss and then open it up for any questions from the audience, okay? Um, I'll just, I think Zach's here. Oh, okay. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us um, in our discussion. So my first question, you know, uh, again, Eve just gave us a thousand plus years of history. Um, you know, many of us have heard many references to World War II and the Soviet Union in recent weeks. We've, we've hear a lot of this in the media right now. Um, so my question is, where are we in this moment in time? You know, are there comparisons to the history of the recent past, um, and how does the sphere of influence that Putin desires compare and contrast with the Iron Curtain of the Cold War? So I'll open it up to our speakers. Well, I think that Putin is not trying to reestablish the Soviet Union. I, I think that, in fact, what he's trying to reestablish is the Russian Empire. And that came out very clearly in the speech he gave just prior to declaring war on Ukraine, where he actually criticized Lenin for creating 
an independent Ukraine. As I've, I've pointed out, that's not really what happened. But he, uh, so I think that what he would like to do is to reestablish a Russian empire. And for a Russian empire, Ukraine is the most important part. Not only in Putin's view, view is it, are Ukrainians actually Russians, but also this was a part of the Russian empire dating back to the mid 17th century. So if he's going to establish a Russian empire, he has to include that. Interesting. Jumping in and looking at the thought process and the context of, you know, where we are in today's existence, uh, one has to look back to, again, World War II and, you know, the Nazis' um, intervention into those territories. And um, one thing that we do look at, and as a Holocaust and genocide scholar, is that we look at how and um, why Hitler went into Czechoslovakia specifically. And we're seeing some of the same rhetoric used between Hitler and Putin in that time frame, uh, at least with, in terms of the language. They may have different outcomes and reasons for the invasion. But if you're looking at a, um, I guess, a systematic approach to their language, it is very similar. The question is, though, is then are we getting into the realm of appeasement, which obviously uh, Ukraine has decided not to appease uh, Putin rather than as the Czechoslovakians did. But the question then leads to, do we go continue along appeasement? Will this continue to, um, I guess, cross over into other territories that, again, a part of the old Russian empire that would be deemed um, appropriate for Putin to go after? Um, I also look at 54, 1954, when Khrushchev made the speech about giving the Crimea to Ukraine, and that being another reason where Putin can use the historical narrative to say that, you know, look, Khrushchev gave them that, but it's still technically Russian territory. So, Yeah, I think both of you give such, I mean, honestly, I really don't have much to, to add on. I think you hit it right on the head. I do think that Putin in particular is trying to regain that national identity of being an imperial power. Um, that's very clear. Um, one of the things though that I think about when I'm thinking about something like the Iron Curtain and how defining that was to World War II, um, I was watching the news the other day and actually someone actually drew what they perceived to be a Iron Curtain 2.0 um, that perhaps he is desiring that is going across Ukraine's border alongside the Western uh, portion of it. And what does that mean? Um, and got into a, an interesting discussion about the fact that what does that mean if that is to happen? right and how close are we to having that happen um and thinking about how first of all large ukraine is right as one of the largest countries um in europe um and thinking about uh the diversity within ukraine right that even as as um even has just laid out so thoroughly um, the fact that um, those living in Ukraine, right, represent various parts, um, various cultures, various um, backgrounds, right, that do not all affiliate um, under particular uh, entities, right? And so there's a complicated kind of discussion here um, about what will happen if he is successful and how close are we to that? And what does that mean for the Ukrainian people who identify with the western side of Europe um, and um, and how and how and how does that play out? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll, there, there's an audience question that I will read now because there's it's quite in line with our conversation. So thank you, Catherine, for your question. And it is are there stronger correlations and parallels with Mussolini rather than Hitler? And what opportunity is there for Putin to go in the way of Mussolini, specifically in regards to Putin slash Mussolini's downfall? Zach, I think you're you're probably better suited to answer this question with your with your expertise. That's actually a great question, Catherine, and I appreciate you for bringing up because that would be my next point is when we're looking at Mussolini and Putin, they both did something quite interesting in the realms of historical narrative, especially with dictators or the idea of this uh, fascist environment is they actually unified this idea of bringing the church into their schemes. So remember, Putin allowed the uh, Russian Orthodox Church to come a part of his organization or allow them to help push his thought process on, you know, this idea of the new Russian atmosphere. And Mussolini does the same thing. Now, the 
question is, is when you kind of go look at the opportunity for it in the downfall, could it be a similar downfall? And with Mussolini, remember, uh, Mussolini starts the downfall because his people start going against him as well. And then you see the United States intervention with the use of the mafioso or the mafia and using them to go against Mussolini. But the question is really, is there similarities? Will the people of Russia actually back that thought process as well? Just like the people of Italy finally started to say, wait a second, there's something wrong here. Um, do we would we call the Russia currently a fascist state? No, because technically they are quote unquote a democracy. So, and um, you know, I work with a lot of Russian students, and that's something we're doing with right now is trying to figure out what information is being spread across the whole way rather than um, you know the stuff that's giving to the people currently. So the misinformation. Yeah, I would add something else here. When we had the Cold War, there was a very clear ideological difference between the West and the Soviet Union in terms of the, the, the ideas of the ideal government, the ideal economy. At this point, what Putin has been pushing is actually an, an illiberal sort of oligarchic capitalism, uh, sort of populist idea, which is actually very common outside of Russia as well. You can see it within NATO members, particularly uh, in Hungary under under Orban, in um, Turkey, under Erdogan. And it, you can see it in the United States where there's a minority, but a staunch minority that is advocating the same sorts of things, an authoritarian sort of government, single party rule, only one political party is, is actually legitimate, pushing for what they see quite wrongly as traditional values and using those sort of hot button issues. Um, some of the sort of the, the populist rhetoric, us versus them, and who are the re who are the people who really count in the country, who are the real, the real citizens. Um, so it's not as clear right now that what Putin is advocating is something which is diametrically opposed to what people within NATO and the West are thinking. I do see a hand up for Deborah, so I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to our conversation, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, someone mentioned uh, Putin wanting to progress to the Western boundaries of Ukraine. Let's talk about NATO. Those countries, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, they are active members, full members of NATO. Do you see that being a deterrent to him to trying to go further West? Do you see NATO as being a real boundary that he would respect? I don't think that um, Putin respects any boundaries, actually. However, I think that he's prudent enough. Those people who are arguing that he's just, you know, gone insane or something, I think have got it wrong. I think that he's very calculating, but he made a serious miscalculation with Ukraine, not realizing, not recognizing how staunchly they would reject annexation by Russia. But the principle of uh, NATO is if any of the countries are attacked, all of them will respond. And Putin, and President Biden has reiterated that. I think that would give um, Putin pause. He could go into Ukraine because Ukraine was not a, a NATO member. And uh, although they hope to become one someday, they this was not in any way imminent. But there are other countries that are nearby that are also not NATO members, particularly Finland, which was itself part of the Russian empire for a long period of time. And the people in Finland are now really, really scared because there's nothing specifically to deter Putin from moving in there, other than the fact that he would not want a, a two front war. To, to add to this conversation as a Polish American with strong ties in Poland and connections there, um, you know, what you are saying is while he's trying to advance in Ukraine, he, he does come sort of just to the border of Poland, right? Um, some of the airstrikes that have been there can be seen from the Polish border and I've seen of the images, however, he doesn't advance close enough. So we're seeing a very calculated and sort of strategic lens, um, you know, because the, if you look at the powers of the U.S. entering or um, Polish or NATO, um, they are a stronger force in comparison to just the Russian forces. So we do see a very calculated approach. Um, I'd make the same argument, Evis, he doesn't really respect boundaries, but NATO might be a significant enough deterrent um, in terms of, of powers there. 
I would agree. I also do believe, though, that he miscalculated in entering Ukraine greatly. And I think about the um, 1994 um, memorandum in Budapest, right, that Ukraine um, had the largest stockpile, one of the largest in the world, and gave that up in um, <clears throat> Um, an effort uh, to be protected and assisted should they be under attack, right? Um, and the idea, an agreement, part of that agreement was for them to be able to maintain um, their sovereignty um, and, 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 and independence. And so, I mean, he has uh, gr ghastly just violated that. Um, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if he has the wherewithal to cross over the line into NATO. Um, I, I don't think that he wants that. Um, but one of the things that uh, he miscalculated, thinking that Ukraine um, is a, a weaker state, right, um, not having the same resources, but the resilience of President Zelensky and, and those to maintain uh, their, their their place in Ukraine, I think, is also um, been uh, very humbling in a sense <laughs> um, for him um, and something that he has to contend with and go back to the table on. Well, I, I think that Putin began to believe his own rhetoric about how Ukrainians are just Russians that have been misled. And he I think he imagined that somehow the response would be similar to the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014, mm -hmm. that there would be the government would, would back, the Ukrainian government would back down, the, the Ukrainian people would accept as a fait accompli, yes, we're, we're not going that direction anymore. Um, maybe Putin would install a puppet government similar to that in Belarus, and that would be firmly within the Russian orbit and the Ukrainian people would just go along with it. But instead, what I think what he was miscalculating was how strongly Ukrainians felt about the annexation of Crimea and particularly about the incursions in Donetsk and Luhansk, which resulted in continuing violence before the explosion a month ago with the new Russian invasion. And how Russians, how, how even Russian ethnic Russians within the Ukrainian state and, and Russian speakers who are maybe of different ethnicities, Jewish or Ukrainian or Tatar, would, would actually join together embracing the Ukrainian citizenship and be willing to resist to protect their, their, own, their own state. So I think that Putin very seriously miscalculated that. But now he doesn't know what to do, because if he backs down and withdraws without getting anything to show for it, he looks weak, something he's tried to, to avoid doing. But he also is in a situation where it's going to be very hard to win because of the Ukrainian resistance and also because of the kind of support that Ukraine is gaining from countries all over the world. As we've seen in recent weeks in news articles, you know, Putin's calculation was that this would be a 48 hour war and that he would install a pro-Russian government in two days. Um, so this was a se severe miscalculation. Um, and it's also really important to note that, you know, since 2014, you know, the Ukrainian, again, another article that I read, Ukrainians have been receiving uh, military training from the U.S. So they have a, a significant um, education within um military training and now also the fierce resistance of protecting um, their democracy and their country. It's interesting too, when we look at, and we, you know, all we talk about miscalculations, but, you know, historically, the historical narrative of this is that, remember, we saw tons of insurgency when the Nazis overtook this land in 41 at the Battle of Kiev. Like, this is nothing that is not known. Um, insurgencies, especially in Ukraine, have always been fierce and harsh. And that's why I think there was a miscalculation by Putin to, to I guess, guess that they're just going to roll over because there's a historical narrative of this. So the Ukrainians are very strong-willed people that believe in their existence as a, a Ukraine, not as a Russian or as a Ukrainian. So that's something too that we're sometimes where I think he miscalculated. The other thing when we're looking at NATO as well is remember, we've never seen a direct superpower on superpower. It's always been proxy. 
So the, if that would happen, then it would be two superpowers going up, going up against each other, which then would, who knows what that leads to. And I know we all can guess and play the game, but that's not what we're here for. The other thing that we can also look at with this um, issue is that with NATO, we're also seeing the flux of weapons going into NATO countries as well. So now these NATO countries that are on the border are being pushed with new missile defense systems. You're seeing different deployments from the United States military. So there is now what we call a deterrent. And the last thing that I thought of too is, is if we were going to look at a peace like we saw before World War II, I think Ukraine would have been a part of it, but Ukraine set the precedent not to become a part of appeasement. <laughs> Just for, you know, I, I realize we're already at 120 and I can talk about this all day. You know, this is definitely a lot of information. Um, I do want to ask my one last question. I do see Catherine has asked another question and I want to open it up to the audience. So if we could simply go in that order and before everyone logs off, I do have an announcement. So please don't quickly log off at 1.30. I, I will ask you that now. Um, so my question, and then Catherine, I'll, I'll ask yours. Um, so what can be done right now? What, what can we do? We're out in the West, right? We're having conversations, but what can we do right now? Well, I would say that we need to continue to do what we're doing, which is to make sure that Ukrainians have the wherewithal to defend themselves. They're doing a good job at it, but they're working with much less in the way of resources other than courage than, than, than Russia has. We also need to take care of those Ukrainians who are seeking refuge in other parts of the world from the war. It's something that in fact, the United States and European, and the, Euro, and the countries of the European Union needed to do with previous groups of refugees, those coming from Syria, those coming from, from Africa, uh, it's, the Americans need to do that with refugees from Haiti and from Central America as well. And in some ways, the willingness to do this for Ukrainians that was not there for other peoples points out to flaws that we have in the West and we need to have some self-examination about it. But I'm not sure that it would be a good idea for the United States to try to engage direct, or NATO countries to try to engage directly with Russia militarily. I'm still thinking about that, about the pros and cons. I think the risks of an expanded war are much greater. And the people who would most suffer would be those in the NATO countries of Eastern Europe, particularly, I think, Poland. Yeah, I, I, I agree <clears throat> with what you just offered there, Eve. I think this is a question that I go back and forth on daily. Um, as we're moving through this, I think, um, number one, the humanitarian efforts just need to be there. Um, and Eve, I appreciate you uh, offering the fact that when we're talking about uh, stepping in on, a hum um, on the, uh, the, the, the human rights um, uh, plane, that we are doing that equitably, right? Um, as we have global crises that are happening across the world. But I think the humanitarian effort, and I was glad to see the resources that were approved by Congress to be able to uh, be sent over to make sure that the Ukrainians have what they need. I will say I had a phone call last Friday from one of my college friends who lives in Germany and her next door neighbor um, just welcomed a family from Ukraine. It's one of her extended cousins um, who had two small children and so she was telling me that her uh, seven-year-old and 10-year-old uh, were getting together and making welcome baskets for the kids that are coming um, from Ukraine. I mean, this is a complete global crisis. And this is not anything that is just happening in one area of the world that this is going to impact us. This is going to, even if there are um, some type of resolve um, in this, this is going to continue to pack, um, Im impact us globally. Um, and I think we need to talk about it. I do agree, uh, even though I do go back and forth, uh, whether or not um, our country needs to go into war and what would that mean for the world? Um, and and I, I, I agree, I'm not sure that that's the answer, uh, but I think the number one approach is making sure that the Ukrainians have what they need to defend themselves, right? Um, and making sure uh, 
that their agency is centered in this moment um, and their humanity is respected. Um, and whatever we can do to galvanize resources to do that, I think that's what that needs to be priority on the agenda. You know, to confirm a lot of the, you know, knowing people on the ground in Poland, a lot of um, the efforts in Poland have been um, shelter, right? Individuals who have homes have been opening up their homes. Um, monasteries have been opening up um, in order to uh, help individuals who have come in. There have been many collections and um, even World Central Kitchen has chefs from around the world at the border actually cooking for refugees who are crossing the border. One of them, most notably the owner of Bear Smokehouse in Connecticut. So there is um, certainly a lot of humanitarian aid um, heading there. And as I've been saying, make please make sure it's credible. Please make sure it's vetted um, there. Um, I will move to Catherine's question just to make sure. And I wanna make sure if anybody else has a question that they have an opportunity. I know we're coming right up to time. Um, so Catherine did ask, is the situation with the Budapest memorandum, similar to how Britain and France said that they would defend Poland when they had no real intent, nor did they have the force to actually fulfill their promise? I'm on mute. Um, thank you for that question. Now, that was a that's a really great question. Um, that's actually something I think I'll need to like look into just a little more though, just to um, understand uh, the ties there. I mean, I think with the Budapest Memorandum, I mean, this was very strategic that it was a negotiation um, that Ukraine would give up their um, nuclear weapons um, that they had a stockpile of um, um, in exchange to be defended if their um, was any type of aggression, and that and that and that was very clear. Um, I think that there could be some um, um, some strings that would you know align that, but it was a little different um, during World War II. But that's certainly something to think about. Well, one thing I can't help but question, and I will say I'm a sociologist, so I come from that perspective, right? You know, a lot of the things as I'm restudying the Soviet Union, um, and I have a few of these conversations with my colleagues, is how much was, um, were policies passed at that time? Because after the fall of the Soviet Union, we had this idea that it'll never happen again. Right. We sort of a lot of the narrative was this wouldn't happen again. We we fought the Soviet Union. We brought down communism. You know, what was sort of the intent and the thinking behind it? I don't know if we'll know. I'm just providing a thought to this conversation. Um, um, and Catherine adds, I'm reading the phony victory by Peter Hitchens. And also my grandmother wrote in her memoir of Poland being a pretext for Britain to declare war. Right. Well, I, I, would, I would add there that the 1994 Budapest Accord was premised on the fact that Russia was going to be a partner rather than a rival. Right. And that, of course, was before Putin had appeared on the scene and began with his empire building. It seemed at the time that it was going to be good and Ukraine would be protected not only by the NATO and the United States, but also that Russia would respect Ukrainian independence and security as well. But what this shows is that as, as governments change their character, the, the uh, treaties that they sign, the agreements that they sign may not be secure enough. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you very much for your contributions to our discussion, um, for talking about, um, again, a thousand plus years of history to try to make sense and context of what is going on. Um, there's a lot to unpack in hours, not nearly enough. We can certainly be talking about it for many, many uh, weeks to come. Um, so this was our first session of this. We have three more. So I would invite you to join us. Um, you know, I would invite you to join us. Our next session is going to be a film review um, led by, I will be moderating, um, but I'll be joined by Dr. Brian Dixon and Dr. Randy Lace from our English department. We will be doing a film review of the movie, Mr. Jones, which uh, follows 
a Welsh journalist who traveled to the Soviet Union and was one of the first individuals to report back about the Holodomor that Eve had uh, discussed. So this was his uncovering of what was happening and reporting back to the West. So we do encourage any participants that would like to join to please view the movie um, beforehand. It is available at the Goodwin Library, but if you don't have access to it, um, there it is also available on Hulu. So we do ask that you watch um, the film. Um, but it is not a requirement. It's just a homework assignment with a suggestion um, to do. It is not a requirement. I'm not giving homework just yet um, because our conversation will focus on some of the key areas of that movie. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about um, history, right? Who writes history? How do Who tells it? How do we know about things and don't know about it? What does, um, what does it mean for today? But also, what are the ethical policies of using the written word? So I, I, I look forward to all of these conversations, but um, getting in a room with Dr. Brian Dixon and Dr. Randy Lace to talk film, I mean, it's it's an experience. So I highly recommend. Um, and Carrie Morin um, has a link to register for that session. It'll be at the same time Thursday at 1.30. If you have any questions, I will stay back for a few minutes, um, but I want to say thank you for attending. Thank you for your time. Um, and thank you so much um, for attending our first session.